and getting rid of waste products. So which two systems, even though they're developing tissue-wise, aren't really being used very efficiently in the fetus during development? Which two systems jump out at you? that aren't really working to their fullest potential, huh? Respiratory system and waste product. Urinary system. How about the digestive system? So more than two, okay. What will happen, uh, especially near the end of pregnancy, um, child will swallow some of the amniotic fluid. So that first bowel movement, has anybody had children and know what I'm talking about? That nasty, tarry, it's called meconium. Um, that is a lot of what's processed from the swallowing of amniotic fluid during fetal development. So <clears throat> that's what we see in that first. swallow too much. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes um, what happens is uh, several different things are going to happen during the labor process. One of the things is that breathing mechanism is going to start to kick in. And sometimes it happens a little bit earlier than it should as a child is coming down the birth canal. So we have some different, different issues that we have to deal with when a child is born um, if this happens. So we see the fetus in several different stages. Embryo at seven weeks. And again, when do we stop calling this an embryo? Yeah, two months-ish, eight weeks. And then fetus in three months. Still pretty small. How big? Let's do metric now. How big is six centimeters? Good, then tell us how big six centimeters is. Uh, about that big, which is about what? Maybe two inches? Right? A little over two inches, right? 2.4 inches, yeah. uh, 2.4 centimeters per inch. So that's still pretty small at three months. Looks like a baby, though, doesn't it? And then uh, fetus late in month five. That's when quarters start getting cramped. And typically, this is when you start feeling movement. Before then, we've got some good space there. So a lot of movement isn't felt. So your uterus, the most amazing muscle that is possessed in us as females, I think in us as the human species, is going to go from a very small pear sized, small pear sized, to a giant nine month whose fundus reads fundus, which is an area of the uterus, very similar to terms we use to describe the stomach. The fundus is going to reach all the way up to the xiphoid process. So give me an example of some of the effects you might feel as mother during this portion of the pregnancy? The, beginning or, um, the end. Oh, like you have to feel the But why? Because you're, the baby's yeah, correct. By this time, hopefully, the child's head is facing down and ready for the birthing process. Unfortunately, some of them aren't doing that quite yet, but typically that head is sitting on your bladder. That fundus of the uterus has expanded and up underneath the xiphoid process. What might also be affected? It, breathing might also be affected at this point as well. Some other effects um, might be digestive, uh, heartburn, reflux. I, I mentioned in the in the in the in the video and last class that diagram on page 1080. What's in blue? Well, 
Well, you should understand circulatory system from the circulatory system. But what you want to understand in this chapter is some of the differences. So you want to understand the differences in fetal circulation versus adult circulation. So look at the placenta, because you're, yeah, but we don't want to be on that side of the diagram because that's the, that's not blood from mother. Exactly. We want to go to that side. So you have an umbilical artery, umbilical vein that are going to feed into where? It's an artery. Sometimes they refer to umbilical vein as well. No. no. Where is it feeding in? The inferior vena cava. Yeah, the inferior vena cava. We also see a lot of blood feeding into the liver as well. What's it going to do? Correct. And then you'll follow the typical circulation pattern. Then what you're going to another difference you're going to see is between the atria. You're going to see a hole between the, the two atria. Blood doesn't, all blood volume doesn't have to go to the respiratory system for oxygenation. A lot of that can just pass and go through the systemic circulation because you don't have to do that, that step. So we see a passageway there. We still need blood in the, in the uh, lungs because the lungs are developing tissue. So blood has to go there as well. And then we'll move to the uh, left. Correct. Oh, it's going to go through the baby's system. Yeah, and then to the Correct. Back through the placental for exchange. So just know the differences in blue in that diagram mm -hmm. as re with respect to structures okay. and what happens to them in the newborn versus the fetus. Thank you. Okay. So um, some of the physiological changes then, gastrointestinal issues. Uh, problems with gas pressure because if you look at the nine-month uterus it's pressing up against a lot of abdominal pelvic organs so you're going to see problems or may see problems with gastrointestinal system urinary system because of pressure what's another thing not only physical pressure from the developing fetus but what else Exactly, because you're, you're doing your, your blood volume because you're also taking care of the developing fetus might lead to pressure issues. Pressure issues can be a problem for the urinary system, as many know when we discussed that. Respiratory system, because it's going to be hard to do what? Sometimes it's just hard to expand the thoracic cavity normally when the fundus of the uterus is up that high under the xiphoid process. Cardiovascular system is going to have to work over time. So those are some of the things you should be aware of with respect to physiological changes during pregnancy. And, and not necessarily. Um, that can be an abnormal occurrence when your body's monitoring systems are having trouble keeping homeostatic levels of things like glucose. So um, preeclampsia due to pressure is discussed under homeostatic imbalances on page 1085. Um, again, pressure in the system is going to disrupt exchange within the systems, including exchange across what? Across the placenta. So that can be an issue, especially near the end of pregnancy, if preeclampsia develops. We're not going to be able to create those pressure gradients and exchange isn't going to take place properly. So that's something that has to be addressed if mother falls into that category. On page 1084, we see one of our famous tables, developmental events of the fetal period. You have to 
understand or have a general understanding of what goes on during these week periods that are outlined in the table. So eight week end of embryonic, what does child look like? Nine to 12 week, three month, what does child look like? General information, you don't have to memorize the whole thing, but you should see some of the differences with respect to um, development during these different periods. 13 to 16 week at the four month period, we're starting to look a little bit more normal now. That cerebrum isn't so large. We start to get more features that are in line with a child that has now developed, well, what we're gonna see in infancy. Seven to 18, uh, excuse me, 17 to 20 week period, five month period, the 21 to 30, six and seven month, now we start to see that infant and all of its features in proportion. And then the 30 to 40 week period at birth. So again, from this table, just general information as to what we see different during the development of the fetus. So, fetus is developed 30 to 40 weeks it's time for what? It's, yeah, it's time to leave. And it's time to leave. What's the signal that it's time to leave? Contractions. And why do we start contractions? Because they're going down the hormones. Hormones are going to say, or trigger it, but what is the stimulus? And this is why it's different for every single person. You know, they, the doctor says an average 40 weeks, but the stimulus is different in every person. Well, when babies are ready to, you know, if it's developed and it's ready to leave. What does it say? Yo, I'm ready to leave. <laughs> the, the lining starts to thin, and the other big cue is stretch. So you'll stretch to a certain point, and whatever that set point is in your body, that's the signal. Remember when we talked about feedback mechanisms way back when in the beginning? Yep, stretch of uterus. When we talked about feedback mechanisms way back in the beginning chapters of anatomy, we had two different types of feedback mechanism. We had a positive feedback mechanism and a negative feedback mechanism. This is a what? It's a positive feedback mechanism. So it's going to start a cycle of release of hormones, which will start a cycle of contractions of a uterus. And when is that going to stop? After the what has been, now, what's it called? What was the stimulus? To stretch. So after the stimulus has been removed, we will stop that cycle, yes? And in this case, childbirth, the stimulus is the stretch, that stretch of the uterus. So there's different stages in which the birthing process takes place. In this diagram, we see some of the hormonal uh, influences associated with getting that uterus to start contracting. And basically what's happening is that child is encased with a uter in, in that uterus, which is a giant muscle, which will contract and push and relax, comes back. Contract, push, relax, come back. See where we're going? So that's going to happen throughout the entire labor process. One of the hormones, important hormones that are going to help keep the uterus contraction or uterine contractions going during the birthing process is which hormone? Oxytocin. Who makes oxytocin? Uh, hypothalamus. Who delivers it? Um, the posterior pituitary gland. Okay. So, initiation of labor then is when, and again, different in all women, that signal comes. 
that stretch is to a certain point, it's time for delivery. So that's the initiation of labor. We have some different hormones, oxytocin. What are prostaglandins doing for me? That's another hormone very important in the birthing process. Yeah, that's going to help with more vigorous stimulation, contraction. Again, I have to squeeze and squeeze in order for a child to be born. So we have to continue that. If we stop that, what's going to happen? <laughs> He's going to go back, or she is going to go back. It's like, no, 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 you must leave. So we have to keep that continuous stimulation during the birthing process. Sometimes what happens um, during labor is for some reason we turn off some of our hormones. Is it, did anybody have that experience? Or hormone levels will start to decrease and de discontinue that contraction rhythm. So what do we do in modern hospitals now? We give them what? You guys probably know it as PIT, right? It's called Pitocin, which is a synthetic form of what? Oxytocin, exactly. So they can start giving you chemicals, Pitocin, to continue the cycle. It's not, I don't think it's in the book. So Pitocin is a synthetic form of oxytocin and that will help you continue with the labor process. Is it in there? No. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yep. So, and that's one of the problems with delivering a child prematurely because one of the chemical signals that's going to help initiate this whole process is surfactant secretion. If they go too early, they haven't produced that. So not only are their, lung, their, their lungs are not mature, it's going to be hard for them for gas exchange in, in the beginning, that, that, those first few hours. Because surfactant, if you remember when we discussed the respiratory system, is going to help with gas exchange by decreasing surface tension. It also is going to help signal mother to start the whole labor process as well. They'll eventually get, because remember, mother's still, mother's still circulating blood. So, yeah, I know, from, from placenta, so those will Correct. Oh. Yeah. And, and the, that amniotic fluid, again, is at, at this point is starting to get quite trashy with respect to waste products that are in there as well. So those are some of the, those are the, much more than we've discussed here. Those are some of the chemical messages that start the birthing process. So we have a dilation stage. So what has to happen? During um, pregnancy, that cervical region that we discussed, the vaginal region after it, kind of gets blocked off from the outside world. During the development of the placenta, we create something called the mucus plug. And that's going to cover that entrance and keep who safe. <laughs> Yeah, baby safe. Um, when the cervix starts to thin, surfactant production is kicking in, baby's ready to leave, that is going to start to flatten out. And what happens to that mucus plug? Eventually, it's going to fall out because now we're widening that region. So that's one of the indicators that the labor process is starting to begin. Again, different women, different different scenarios, but you might lose that mucus plug and then all of a sudden start to feel a little crampy and then it's time for labor or nothing, <laughs> which is frustrating. So um, that's why it falls out, because the cervix is starting to thin from those chemical messages and that's going to happen during the dilation stage, the beginning part, early dilation stage of the labor process. That just the, the contractions. Think of think of what's happening inside the year. It's gonna break the. It's gonna burst the balloon basically. And sometimes that doesn't happen naturally either. Sometimes you, we need a little help during the labor process. Two different children, two different labors. 
um, labor didn't start till my water broke. And that's when the amniotic sac with number two. With number one, they had to break my amniotic sac because it never did. I was in labor for probably eight hours before they finally broke the amniotic sac. So that's going to happen for different women at different times, but it's due to the pressure of the contraction of the uterus. So during that stage, dilation stage, it can last short, long, again, all women, different. Exactly each delivery, each labor is totally different, um, but that can actually start way before you go into labor. Four weeks before number two was born, I started dilation. I was four centimeters dilated for four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. Before. Yeah. Before. Huh? Yes. Yeah, that cervix thinning and starting to, to get larger. Four weeks. Again, different. Second, number two, I mean number one, totally different. So that can, that can be very different for each pregnancy. So it says dilation stage is the longest part of labor, lasting 6 to 12 hours. And some of you probably <laughs> laugh at that because some of you realize that it can last a whole heck of a lot longer than that, depending on your pregnancy. Once we've reached that 10 centimeter dilation, what do we start doing? after late dilation. And now it's time. Now we've widened that opening as much as we possibly can. Other hormones like relaxin are also being secreted to help loosen up what? I, lo I love the name of that hormone, relaxin. There's no relaxin going on when relaxin's being released. No, it helps loosen up what? Where does baby have to pass? Yeah, the coxal bone. So that pubic symphysis is starting to, with the help of relaxin, starting to loosen up just a little bit because head has to then pass through that space. When you did the uh, skeletal system, you saw the difference between a male and a female skeleton, correct? That pelvic brim in a female skeleton was much, much larger. Why? Yeah, we got to deliver babies. So during the expulsion stage, we start to see head coming through the birthing canal. Crowning is when I start to see the top of the head. Again, during a normal delivery, the child ideally should be facing down. So their nose, that nice squishy part, should be facing what? Facing the floor or your spinal cord, yes? Anybody know about back labor? Yeah, number one was whoosh, looking in the other direction. So this was whacking into my spinal cord rather than this. Much more painful. But baby should be facing down, looking at your spinal cord when we're in the expulsion stage. Again. That's called breech birth. That can be an issue because, remember, not only are we passing child during this whole phase, but we're also passing that um, placenta and the umbilical cord. And unfortunately, things can get all caught up in there uh, if b baby is in the wrong direction. Not only can we tangle up in the umbilical cord, but it could also be much more difficult to pass through the birthing canal in that position. Usually, um, we're brought in for a C-section, or in the old days, they would physically turn the child if they could. They still try that? They do try. Yeah, some, some um, why my, my brain is blanking today. The ladies that help you give birth. Midwives. Midwives um, are trained to do um, this procedure as well. Breach. Usually at this point, no, it, 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 I, I, I heard them saying that it's frequency as well. 
No, preeclampsia is, is, pressure, is pressure in the system. Yeah. Not only that, it could be anything. Um, right. Could be well, blocking off circulation in yeah. any way. See, that, because I heard them saying that it's preeclampsia as well. It's not, no. Well, it can, pre, can pre eclampsia can lead to that yeah. as well. <laughs> I'm trying to think, is there a term? What the heck? Yeah, but I'm trying to think, there is a term for that. I can't think of the name of it. Yeah, it was wrapped around. Twice here and there. And back then, uh, how many years ago, you know, um, they didn't actually, um, my grandmother wasn't giving her birth in the, in the hospital. It was whole. Right. And one of the midwives was helping her. It took her two days, 48 hours to deliver my father. Wow. He was absolutely blue. He, they thought. Yeah, he was, yeah. He would never make it, but... Yeah, he did. <laughs> Obviously, you're here, right? Yeah, he was seven months. Yeah. Well, usually, seven months would not survive. Oh, no, seven months is a pretty decent amount of time, yeah. Six months, really. Yeah, no, seven, well, look at... Yeah, and, and back in those days, without the aid of... Um, yeah, 32 weeks is pretty... And, and look at that chart. You can see you're pretty developed. The, the biggest issue would be lung issues. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah, all wrapped up exactly, and was getting those signals. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think my mother was out for all of us too. Yep. Yep. Miss the old days. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah. So yeah. filled her in after after the fact. Is it English movie? It's like a. Um, I saw something online. There's a actually series of movies about midwives. I love those. You know, it's like a series of different kind of stories yep. about midwives back in 1920. Yep. And what you know what we have today with respect to um, technology that can help with the breathing. I mean, you see some of these tiny, tiny little babies. My daughter sent me a, um, a little YouTube the other day. It just brought me to tears. But the baby was one and a quarter pounds at birth and survived and is the most beautiful child. So, yeah, with modern technology, we're, we're able to do some amazing things in our uh, NICUs. So once child has been expelled during the expulsion stage, it is not over yet, my friends. What do we have to do next? Think about the whole labor process. You're producing these hormones, these feedback systems. You have quite a bit of this hormone still left in your system that continues to cause uterine contractions after the expulsion. That will continue to cause uterine contractions until what happens? No, sometimes it doesn't. But in theory, we'll continue uterine contractions until the levels of hormone dissipate through the system. When you stop releasing as much and when they are broken down, physiologically broken down by the chemicals in our system. That stage is the placental stage. So we still have uterine contractions, again in theory, and what, why is that important? Yeah, this is when we're going to, the placenta is also going to be delivered. So not only do we have to deliver the child during the delivery process, we have to deliver the placenta as well. From all that contraction and all that action going on during the labor process, the placenta is going to start to rip away from the uterine wall. Uh, important that we get the entire placenta out because after baby is born, the placenta is no longer viable tissue. 
Yeah, and that can be a big problem for mother, yes? Because now you have decaying tissue in your uterus. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hey. <laughs> Lucky you. So, yeah, we have to make sure that the placenta is completely delivered, that all of the placenta leaves the uterus during the placental stage for the safety of mother. Yeah, you still, because those, and, and again, uh, sometimes you, you'll bleed in different amounts, especially if it's your first delivery. Women tend to bleed longer for longer periods of time, but the type of bleeding you're going to do is very distinctive of whether or not you've passed that placenta. And if it doesn't, is there a way they can Yeah, they have to go, yeah, they have to actually physically go in and do a, a DNC-like procedure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, there's a lot of a lot of cultures that's very sacred tissue. Um, the placenta. Well, in the, in the network of blood vessels that kept yeah. the child, you know, nourished through. Correct. That's exactly the connection between mother and baby. So um, what else do we want to cover? Taking that first breath, um, some of the different tests that are done after baby is born to make sure that all of the systems have kicked in. Um, that's what we call the APGAR score. At one and five minutes after birth, different testing is done, looking at color, breathing rate, all kinds of things. There's a big list. If you go into pediatric nursing or if nursing at all, you're going to probably know what the list is with, re with respect to the APGAR score. But that's what it is. It's a checklist. We want to make sure color under the fingernails starts to look good. We want to make sure um, skin color looks good. We're going to look at some different reflexes, some of those different reflexes that we looked at um, when we discussed the nervous system. So that's what's part of the APGAR score. Taking that first breath, that transitional period, um, this is going to help kick in some closures as well, closures with respect to differences in the circulatory system. So when baby starts breathing on their own, inflating those lungs for the first time, we're going to start seeing some of those complete closures, that umbilical vein, umbilical artery, the fossa ovalis versus the foramen ovale, those closures are going to start to become more complete. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. Depends on the on the, the birth and the circumstances behind the birth. I don't know if they do that routinely. Arterial sample. They do a they do a venous sample, pretty much right at birth. And there's a couple of different, again, procedures in hospitals are different. But there's tests that have to be done. Is that I mean, are they just checking basically for the health and viability of the baby after? Birth? Yeah. And it depends. You might have run into some circumstances where there's certain history of certain disease states in, in families, so they have to check certain things right at the birth. Um, usually, yeah, well, they look at uh, waste levels. And then if we see when uh, mother's water breaks, if it's, if it's dark, then baby might have taken that first bowel movement in the amniotic fluid. So then you run into a whole bunch of other problems where we might have this, some of this in the lungs. Well, that happens a lot, doesn't it? Um, it, it happens. Uh, well, I, I don't know about a lot, but it happens. It's, it's not unusual that it happens. 
and then we have to worry about um, lung things. So it depends. It depends on, on the hospital and their procedure. Certain blood tests are done automatically, one for what we call PKU, phenylketourea, um, which is a digestive issue, problem with um, producing a certain amino acid and then being able to break it down, build up of that amino acid. Waste product in systems can cause nervous system damage. So those are some of the things that get done. Well, I, just, I found it interesting just because I know like, it's, you know, most women to go into blood work is they just, you know, drop in your arm and whereas like in an infant, and it does sort of make sense because they're, you know, brand new that it's, I mean, I, I, like I remember the nurse was like flustered, but she was like extremely concerned that they were labeled correctly, that this was Venus and this was arterial yeah. and that they were kept separate and, Yeah, you know, so it depends. Um, you'd have to know what the, what the hospital's procedure was and what exactly those tests were. So yeah. there's a whole bunch of different things they can do depending on the, the birth situation. All right, so the next thing in the textbook, they talk about some of the differences in fetal uh, circulation. So again, from that uh, diagram, you, you know the drill. Lactation at this point is also going to start, and, and it sort of starts during the labor process, at least the hormonal stimulation anyway of lactation. So what is going to help lactation kick in? Breastfeeding. Now, what, what is lactation though? Who's going who's gonna to initiate it? Milk production, Milk production. by who? Uh, Which hormone? Hormone pro prolactin. Yeah. Prolactin. Yeah. Yep. So, so what about the luteinizing hormone? Luteinizing hormone, that's the, that's that's way oxytocin early. Well. Yeah, oxytocin and prolactin are the, are the, are the players in lactation. Um, so stimulation, mechanism, mechanoreceptors, physical stimulation. That baby's first suckling on uh, mother's breast is going to help stimulate the release of some of these hormones. So in this diagram, we see hypothalamic release, prolactin, PRF. What's that? Yeah, so prolactin releasing factors are going to enter into the circulatory system. That's going to stimulate the release of prolactin. Once we get that into the blood, that's going to stimulate um, milk release. Milk production is going to happen earlier on, but milk release, which we refer to as letdown, is going to happen with the help of the other hormone during the labor process, oxytocin. So, what, why is mother's milk best for our new baby? It was made for the baby in a human, yes? So all of those things. So you mentioned what? Exactly, so there's certain antibodies, IgA antibodies that we discussed when we discussed the immune system. We're gonna find those in mother's milk we have the nutrients that were meant specifically for human children in mother's milk. Uh, we also have almost a natural laxative effect in that first mother's milk. What's that first mother's milk called? Is it the C? Colostrum. Okay, and that's going to help baby's digestive system kick in. So that acts as a natural laxative almost to start peristalsis going in the digestive system of your infant. So there's a whole bunch of great chemicals in there, great nutrients in there, a little bit of protection in there to help baby um, and their new entry into the world. What's next? Reproductive technology. So anything that we've discussed in these two chapters that is blocked or doesn't progress at a normal rate can prevent fertilization and implantation and gestation. So we have developed many different technologies that can help aid in contraception. And this diagram shows us some um, 
techniques in males and females that can stop pregnancy from happening or help to, with technology, provide um, some of those missing links for certain patients to help with contraception. So am I going to make you memorize this? No. But it's pretty interesting information. It's a closer look on page 1090 and 1091. What's the abstinence? The who? Abstinence is if, if no sex, yes. <laughs> Abstaining from intercourse. Why are they both pointing to the male? I know. Yes, right? Like it's our fault. Like it's our fault. Yeah, so abstinence, if, the, if, if there's no implant, if there's no uh, insertion of sperm into the female's body, pregnancy isn't going to take place. There's also female condom as well, um, a little bit more cumbersome, but yeah. So these are some of the different methods to prevent pregnancy. And then in this book, we also talk about, I think it's on page... 1089, some assisted reproductive technologies and reproductive cloning. So we can actually create those beginning cells in a Petri dish, yes? If we can get a mother to mature that oocyte and give us some ovum, we can take that ovum and the fertilization process can be done outside the body in a test tube. Do you know what they call that? They call it, well, the first one was called the test tube baby. But anytime you do something in the lab in a tube or outside, it's called in vitro. So if I create the embryo, those, and it's not really an embryo yet until implantation has taken place, it's more like that marula and blastula stage. If we create that outside the body, it can then be implanted into the female's uterus. If implantation takes place, then normal development can take place as well. So in vitro fertilization refers to creating that first beginning stages and then implanting into mother. So those are some of the um, examples of assisted contraception. All right, my friends. Did they talk about um, sexually transmitted diseases in this? It was in the last one. Yeah. So some of these um, birth control techniques are not going to be effective preventing sexually transmitted disease. So. Like the pill. Correct. Because it doesn't protect you. It gives you no barrier from the disease that's being transmitted sexually. All right, my friends, that's the end of 28. Now we are in. Yes. You can give a little cheer if you'd like. The last chapter of this course, which is two semesters, 29 chapters of anatomy. Give yourself a little hand. Well, we're not done yet, so don't clap too hard. But you've gotten through 1,094 pages of information in this book. Wow. Yeah, you're ready to be done. I hear you. <laughs> so this is where it all begins. And our textbook, this textbook, is extremely basic with respect to heredity. Heredity, genetics, that's a whole science in itself. And our textbook is very, very basic. So what I want to leave you with from this class with respect to heredity is a basic understanding, some basic terminology. So if you go on and you decide you want to take a genetics class, you have that basic terminology under your belt. So the book starts out with the vocabulary of genetics. Remember, when we talk about genetics, we're talking about what? DNA. DNA our map. 
the molecules that make us who we are, the molecules for protein synthesis, yes? Remember way back when, when we talked about protein synthesis? DNA was the template for all of the proteins that we make in our body. So all of the proteins that make muscle, all of the proteins that make our enzymes, those come from that map. So when we talk about heredity, we talk about the map and how we produce it and pass it on to other individuals in the species. So some of the different vocabularies of genetics with respect to that, that map that you have. We have an understanding, I hope we have an understanding of how much of a map we have. How much map does a human have? How many chromosomes do you have? We have 46 chromosomes. That is basically, and what we see up here is something called a karyotype of your chromosomes. We're going to pull out those chromosomes during what? In a karyotype. Do you know? We are pulling them. Yep, we're pulling them out of a cell that's undergoing what? Because when it's undergoing this, you can see them really, really clearly. When, my, when we're undergoing mitosis, when a cell is in its mitotic stages, we can see those chromosomes because they've done what? Duplication. They've duplicated. They've paired up. They're ready to go and split. And that's where, what type of cell we use to pull out during a karyotype. So what you see here is 23 pairs of chromosomes, and they pair up based on the information on those chromosomes. We've already discussed that during meiosis, we're going to split our cells and give our offspring half the information that's needed. But you, as an individual, to be a new individual, have to have two copies of everything. So for all the proteins that you make, pretty much, unless you're male, you have two copies in your chromosomes to make those proteins. So proteins for eye color, for example, you have two copies or two copies of the portion of genetic material that makes the proteins that you will then see as eye color. Who did I get them from? I got one copy of the information from mother. I got one copy of the information from father. Those cells are produced during what? The half, half the information cells. During meiosis. So during meiosis, we produce cells with half the genetic material. Genetic material consists of our 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have 23 chromosomes worth of information that make us who we are, and we have two copies of those chromosomes. 22 of those pairs are called autosomes, and they produce a whole bunch of different proteins that make us who we are. The 23rd pair in this grouping is called the sex chromosomes, and they contain information that are going to produce what? Yeah, the different gender of the species. So some of the differences that we've discussed in this course with respect to reproductive organs, with respect to hormone production, there's where we see those proteins that are produced on those last pair, or sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes are of two type in human. We can have an X and we can have a Y. If we have a female, she possesses what? Two X chromosomes. If we have a male, we have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. So, know the term sex chromosome, that 23rd pair, X and Y for humans, and then autosomes, the other 22 pairs that are going to make all of the other things that make you who you are. Correct, because now we're going to learn a little bit about genetics. 
So during the meiosis process, I make reproductive cells. Remember, I have two pairs of everything, but I can only give my reproductive cells what? One copy, right? Okay. The next thing the book talks about is your genome, all the information that makes you who you are, and something called an allele. An allele, if I look at genetic material, and I'm going to make my very poor drawing of DNA, because it's supposed to be a double helix, right? An allele is a portion of my genetic material that's going to code for a certain protein. And that certain protein can exhibit itself as certain characteristics. Again, let me give you an example. I have brown eyes. I carry two alleles for what? Brown. No, not necessarily. I carry two alleles for eye color. Yes? Do they have to be the same? No. no. So here's where different terms come in. Again, we're just we're basically getting some terminology for genetics here. So that information that's contained on those chromosomes that we have pairs of don't necessarily have to be the same bits of information that code for the same proteins. So understand what an allele is. An allele is a portion or section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. If I have two copies of the same information, so say I have brown eyes and I have two copies of a gene, allele, that's going to code for a protein that would give me brown eyes. I am said to be homozygous. Homozygous means what? Correct. So the same alleles on both of the chromosomes have the same code that code for the same protein. What if I don't have the same allele on both chromosomes? I'm said to be heterozygous. There's a different eye color, right? Not everybody in this class has the same eyes. I have brown eyes. You have you have gray eyes. Who's got blue eyes? Yeah, blue. Yeah, and there's variations in between. There's like a hazel. There's a whole bunch of different alleles we can possess as humans. And what you're wearing. <laughs> yeah, because you have more of a blood supply to enhance those proteins. Okay. So it's changing. Yeah. Oh, it does. It yeah. does. And again, it has to do with the proteins and the integrity of them being produced. So alleles, bits of information. If I have the same two homozygous, if I have different two heterozygous. Some of the traits that humans possess, some of the proteins that humans possess, sometimes mask the other one that they have. So I have, again, let me draw my little pair of chromosomes. I have two alleles for, let's keep going with eye color since we're on the subject. If I have a dominant allele and some traits are dominant and some traits are recessive, they actually mask the expression of some of the proteins in a recessive allele. Let me give you an example. Brown, for example. I wish I had different colored chalk. If I took a brown crayon and I made a mark on the board over a blue crayon, what would you see? Brown. I would see brown. Even though both of them were colored on the board, I would see brown. Brown is what we call dominant to blue. Not all alleles follow this, but there are some traits that we call dominant and recessive. In order to see blue, what would I have to have? 
two copies of that blue. So only one type of crayon, blue. If I have anything else, it's going to do what? It's going to mask that blue or blend with that blue to give me some different variations of eye color. I'll show you. So, terms we, to recap, homozygous, heterozygous. Some traits are dominant, some traits are recessive. When I look at someone, I see certain characteristics. This is what we call your phenotype. It's the outward expression of the proteins that you possess. Again, sticking with the eye color, my phenotype is brown. Your phenotype is gray. But that doesn't really necessarily, depending on the trait, tell us what genes you have. What's that called? Genotype. Your genotype. Especially when we talk about dominant and recessive traits. So I'm going to do a quick little genetics lesson for you with respect to how to figure out or how to try to determine what your offspring are going to look like. Remember, I have two copies of everything. But when my cells undergo meiosis to make my reproductive cells, I can only give what to those reproductive cells? One copy. So say I have a brown-eyed individual. Why did I do that? Do you know why I did that? I have brown eyes, but I know I have at least one brown-eyed allele, but honestly, I don't know what the other one is, because it could be what? It could be a recessive trait that's being masked by my brown-eyed protein. So what if I cross that individual with, and you asked the question, so I'm going to make this cross, another brown-eyed individual. And you said the offspring was what? Blue-eyed. Blue what does my genotype have to be if I'm blue-eyed? It's got to be, I'm going to make the recessive trait a small letter. I have to be homozygous for that blue-eyed trait. So if I have two brown-eyed parents, I'm going to try and estimate figure out what my offspring look like. And this little contraption here, which we'll talk about a little later, is called a what? This is called a Punnett square. It's a statistical way to figure out what your offspring are going to look like. All right, let me give you an example. If I have these two parents, both with brown eyes, that mate and have kids, what are the statistical possibilities for eye color with respect to these children? Watch. I can only give one of these to my offspring. Yes? So I can only give one of these to my reproductive cells. So say this is the female. What do my oocytes look like with respect to eye color? Remember, I can only give one. One's going to be that big B, and I could also make an oocyte that has what? Little b. Correct. In this case. How about the male? Same. Same thing, right? Big B, little b. And again, you'll see this in genetics. You typically use the smaller letter to denote the recessive trait. Now, these guys, fertilization is going to happen. So that's what happens in the box of the Punnett square. So oocyte comes together with sperm. For this child, what is my genotype going to be? Two big Bs, which gives me a phenotype of what? Brown. Brown. Big B, little b. What's my phenotype? Still brown. Big B, little b. Brown. Another brown. How about this guy? Blue. blue. So can two brown-eyed individuals have a blue-eyed child? Yes. Yeah. If, if the brown-eyed individuals are what? Give me the word. 
heterozygous for the trait. What does heterozygous mean? Correct. So, okay. I have a question. Yep. Yep. Why they had um, uh, brown and blue? So they because that's what they got from their parents. From their parents. Correct. Okay, so we as the parents, when they um, we have our genetic information uh, made from our parents. Correct. So Oh, there's a whole bunch. There's okay. so I just use blue and brown just because it's easier to get. So but there's a lot more than just blue and brown. So you always have two elements from both of your parents. Yeah. You have. It's not just two. Sometimes some traits are affected by more than one allele. We have multiple allele inheritance too. Again, I'm making this as simple for eye color. Actually, it's not just one. It's actually two. <laughs> But we're making, I'm trying to make it simple. I'm just trying to understand how, uh, let's say. Let me, let, me, let me finish with my story, OK? And I'll give you an example of my family. Many years ago, before genetic engineering and all the science that we have that can actually tell us what these alleles are, we would have to look at family traits. We would have to look at something called, uh, oh, they put it in your book? Oh, they don't put it in there. It's kind of like a little family tree sort of thing. So with respect to eye color, you would have to look at grandparents and great-grandparents to see what those physical traits were to try and figure out what your genotype was. So I'll give you an example of what happened in my family. My parents, both my parents, have brown eyes. Both my sister and I have brown eyes. I married a blue-eyed man. I have two children. My first child has brown eyes. My second child has blue eyes. What's my genotype? Correct. Where the heck did that come from? My father and mother both had brown eyes. My sister and I both had brown eyes. So we don't necessarily have to see these traits in every generation, especially if they fall into the dominant recessive category. If I look back at my family tree, my mother's father had blue eyes. Correct. Your dad could have been homozygous. Correct. No, I ended up with brown. Sorry. So somebody. The dominant. My father could be heterozygous too. Who knows? He could be. Yeah. When we look back in his family tree, we don't see any blue eyes for a long, long time. But that doesn't mean it's not there. And that's what we have to understand with respect to genetics and genetic engineering that we can carry alleles for traits that we don't see for many, many years. When we want to test to see if somebody is heterozygous for a trait, if the trait is dominant and recessive, we do something called a test cross. Now, it's a little bit difficult to do with humans because, you know, a little un unethical. But my husband had what? He has blue eyes. So he is what? homozygous blue-eyed. He's got two recessive alleles. One of my kids has blue eyes, yes? So I know that I am heterozygous for the trait, and let's see how this pun and square turns out. Again, I can only give one of these alleles to my offspring. So does everybody understand how this thing works? Kind of breaks it up for us so that we can we can do it without getting confused. So this is one of my oh, possible OO sites. <clears throat> it's 
excuse me, and that's another one of my possible OO sites. My husband, they're both going to be blue because that's all he's got. So what are my kids going to look like? Correct. With this particular allelic combination, there's a 50% chance that my offspring is going to have blue eyes. Now here's the kicker. Do we ever have to see blue eyes in those kids? You only have two offspring. They could both have brown eyes. They could both have blue eyes. Because every statistical possibility has an even amount of chance of happening. Yes? And since you only have two offspring, or three offspring, or four, I could have had four kids all with brown eyes and never known that I was what? Heterozygous, Heterozygous for the trait. How about green? Is it a mixture? It's a mixture. It's a combination. Blue. No, there's different. When we talk about genetics, we talk about a code, DNA code. You know, A's, T's, C's, and G's, all that wonderful stuff. And a certain allele will contain a certain pattern, and that will equate to a different pattern of amino acids. As we develop as a species, what happens is we possess alleles for things like eye color. And sometimes there's very slight changes in those codes with time. So what we'll see in different species is many combinations of different alleles with time. So who knows, the first humans, all, who knows, might have all had brown eyes. And then as the cells reproduce themselves, the species reproduce themselves, we started to see changes in some of those alleles. We're calling those mutations, differences in the amino acid pattern based on the changes in the DNA. Those mutations can then result in different patterns phenotypically because of different proteins that are being produced. So we might see variations in eye colors based on mutations with time in a species. Did you? No. Because he would have had, he would have made, unless there's some reason why he's not producing those proteins, we would see them phenotypically. What do you mean? No, not for that trait, at least as far as we know. Not for eyes? Blue can't ever be dominant? No. Uh, and again, depending on variations. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly not that well versed in, so, in the specifics of dominant recessive genetics. But I'm not sure which one is dominant to what. But I know brown eyes is dominant to blue eyes. And then we have variations in between, hazel eyes, green eyes. Yep. So that's a variation that presents itself. Yep. Those two alleles, the proteins that produced, are are phenotypically presenting themselves in you as that grayish color. And unfortunately, it's not that cut and dry. <laughs> Well, with respect to genetics. So understand genotype, the types of genes I have for these certain traits. Understand phenotype, how these proteins project themselves. So what I see visually, back to the eye color. If I am, have a genotype of little b, little b, my phenotype is what? Blue-eyed. If I have a genotype of big B, little b, my phenotype is brown. If I'm big B, little b, I'm heterozygous for that trait. If I'm little b, little b, I'm homozygous for the trait. Okay, so that's what, again, that's my goal here is that you understand the terminology of genetics. Um, And this is homozygous too. Yeah, the little bees, so if it's mixture, it's a heterozygous. 
Correct. So this and this is both homozygous. This is heterozygous. This is the recessive. These the in this. Yep. Yeah. And that one is a, a mixture. Uh, well, this is dominant, and this is dominant too because you at least have one copy. So think of think of my crayon analogy. If I'm given two different crayons, a brown one and a blue one, what am I going to see? Phenotype, brown. So it's still it, because you possess at least one dominant gene, that's what you're going to see phenotypically. Now that shade of brown might be lighter than if you're homozygous brown-eyed. Who knows? So you might see variations of, and again, um, when we talk about genetics, it's not just the genes that you possess that are going to give us our phenotype. It can also be the expression of those genes, the amount of proteins that you produce. When we talk about, I don't think they talk about, in my biology class, we, uh, we talk about um, uh, something called incomplete dominance. What happens is I possess genetic information for a trait that doesn't necessarily mask an entire trait. So what we might see in the phenotype of an individual who's heterozygous is kind of an intermediate. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that next class. So we see things that are not necessarily a blending of information, but we see intermediates because of it. Um, when we talk about the, the founder of the concepts of genetics, we talk about a man named Gregor Mendel. And he did a lot of his work using peas and the plants of peas and combining different oocyte and sperm. In plants, pollen is sperm. The oocyte, plants are sexually reproducing organisms, are usually housed inside the flower of the plant. So sperm, pollen, is going to be deposited onto the plant. And fertilization, just like in humans, takes place within the plant. The result is a seed. The seed, depending on the plant organism, is then that new individual. When I take it and I plant it, I get a whole brand new individual that grows up and might have a blending of different characteristics from different plants. Just like males and females, their offspring is basically a blending of their genetic information. So understand genotype, understand phenotype, and we're going to pick up with sexual sources of genetic variation because meiosis, and I want you to read this over, meiosis is a little bit different with respect to splitting up those alleles than just regular old mitosis. Mitosis is a nice even splitting of genetic information. With meiosis, I'm going to take the information and jumble it all up and then split it. You're still only going to get one copy of your eye color, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one total chromosome that's complete that you get. So look that over and we'll pick up with that on Thursday.